welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Hi, all. I have a few announcements I'd like to make before we dive into today's episode. First, I wanted to let you know that if you'd prefer an ad free experience and would also like early access to new episodes, you can join us at patreon.com slash psych podcast. That's patreon.com slash psych podcast for a completely ad free experience and also early access to new episodes. Also, I wanted to let you know that my Transcend course is coming back in February. Yay! The next iteration of the course will offer even more ways to help you live a more fulfilling, meaningful, creative, and self-actualized life. There will only be 150 limited slots available, though, so you're going to want to save your spot as soon as possible and also catch the early bird special. So you can go to transcendcourse.com to sign up. That's transcendcourse.com. Okay, now let's dive into today's episode. So today we have Matt Ridley on the podcast. Matt is the author of the recently released How Innovation Works, as well as The Rational Optimist and several other books related to science and human progress, which have sold over a million copies. He's also a biologist, newspaper columnist, and member of the House of Lords in the United Kingdom. Matt, great to chat with you. So you first came to my attention when I was in grad school and I read The Red Queen. I was doing research that time, but your book was very inspirational to me. I just want to thank you for really inspiring me to to do what I'm doing today. So what does it mean to be a rational optimist? Well, that's a good question. My reason for using the word rational in that phrase is because I'm not an optimist by temperament or hope. Uh, I'm an optimist because the evidence is pointing me towards optimism. In other words, I wrote that book in 2010. It came out in 2010. And it was reflecting on the fact that I had been steeped in pessimism as a young person. I was very interested in the environment and conservation and worked in that area. Uh, And so I imbibed all the pessimistic stuff about the population explosion, about pollution, about species extinction, about habitat loss and all that kind of thing, as well as more general economic pessimism about how the world was, was doomed. And I ended up, you know, expecting my life to get steadily worse as I grew up. When it didn't, when I found I was living in a time of increasing prosperity, I began to look at the numbers and at the evidence and I was astonished by what I found. I thought I was writing a book about progress, and I would say progress is good in some areas and bad in others. And I kept being unable to find areas where it was bad, where things were going in the wrong direction. There's a few, but they're pretty minor. I mean, I thought happiness was going to be one where happiness was getting less widespread. I mean, we were becoming less happy. That's what everybody says. There was even a theory explaining it. Turns out the evidence just doesn't support that, that the richer you are, the happier you are within countries, between countries, and within your own lifetime. And so, of course, not everybody is rich and happy. Some people are rich and miserable, but that's probably a good thing because it cheers up other people uh, when that happens. My point is that whether you're looking at economic, environmental, medical, uh, all sorts of other things, uh, the most extraordinary improvements in, in, in our living standards Human income has trebled in our lifetime globally, in real terms. Lifespan has gone up by a third, child mortality down by two-thirds, the amount of oil spilled in the ocean down by 90%, your chances of dying in a plane crash 99% down. You know, fact after fact shows the world going in a better direction. Explaining that was interesting to me, but also telling people that, because it turns out that The vast majority of people think the world is getting worse, think people are getting poorer, think uh, everything's deteriorating. And yes, some things are, because the media attention is so relentlessly focused only on the things and the places that are going wrong, we get misled. Sure. Then that's a similar approach that Steven Pinker takes to studying this and looking at the, the, the general trends. Did you write that before he wrote his 
Yes, uh, I knew he was writing The Better Angels of Our Nature, and I went to talk to him to find out what he was writing, because, you know, writing a, the same, trying to write the same book as Stephen Pinker is not a good strategy, because he, he writes so beautifully. And it turned out he was focusing entirely on the issue of violence. But Rational Optimist came out before Better Angels, and well before Enlightenment Now, which is his more recent book on the same subject. But they're both terrific books, great books. Yeah, they are very good books. He was on this podcast, and I asked him the question that just people inevitably will ask, and they will ask you this question over and over and over again, which is, well, that's cold comfort for the person who, whose personal life sucks. <laughs> you know, whose personal life is, well, they're in poverty, they're, they're experiencing, you know, racism is a big issue. And various places around the world, people are saying that it, these issues are still at a systemic level. And what do, you, what do you do when people make that argument? What do you say to that? I say that doesn't change the facts. I'm simply telling you the facts about the world. And I also say, look, I think it's quite important to give young people hope rather than a counsel of despair, as long as that hope is based on evidence. Because I think it's far worse to tell a young person who may not be well off there's no chance of you ever becoming well off. In fact, you're going to be crushed by racism and poverty and ill health and pollution your whole life. If you say, no, actually, you may be living in an, an impoverished life in Ethiopia at the moment and have poor health and have low income and are struggling to find decent food. But here's a fact that might interest you. The average income of the average Ethiopian has doubled in 10 years. The amount of food available to Africans per head has gone up dramatically in the last 20 years. The chances of someone dying in warfare in Africa has gone down dramatically in the last 10 years. Your chances of dying of malaria, the number of people dying of malaria in Africa has halved in the last 20 years. So miserable as you may be now, there is hope that we can, you can, find a way out of poverty and misery, and the, there are ways in which other people are achieving that, let's do our best to make sure they're available to you, and let's give you the chance to enjoy the prosperity that many others have had. Ten years ago, when I wrote The Rational Optimist, it was quite common to hear the argument, yes, Asia has experienced dramatic economic growth and lifted a lot of people out of poverty in China and India and elsewhere. But no, that's never going to happen to Africa. Africa is always going to be permanently extremely poor. There are just too many people and not enough resources and not enough opportunities. And you would hear this argument quite often. And in that book, I actually took on that argument and I kept saying, look, actually, I don't think that's true. I think you're going to see the same break out improvements in human living standards because of what the Gates Foundation is doing, but also because of what Africans themselves are doing to help themselves. And for that, do you know what? One reviewer actually accused me of being a racist because he said I, I used the phrase even in Africa. I thought this was incredibly unfair because my point was I was saying, yes, you guys who say this can't happen in Africa. Yes, even in Africa it can happen. So I was being the opposite of, of, of racism. But Reviewers see what they want to see. Actually, I became friendly with that reviewer afterwards, and, and he did admit he'd misread that point. So, well, this is very interesting because you've convinced me that it's important to know about my probabilities for certain things so I could, or else, you know, I could make an infinite number of decisions throughout the course of the day. And it's nice to be informed by what is more probable and what's less probable. If I cross the street at this point and there are this many cars, Maybe I shouldn't just run. <laughs> okay, you know, these sorts of things. So You, you will know the name Hans Rosling, who, who is something of a godfather to us, a rational optimists. He started giving incredible talks and eventually wrote a very good book called Factfulness. Sadly, he's died. But he did a rather brilliant thing, which was he asked a thousand Americans, uh, he did the same in the UK, in the last 20 years, has the percentage of the world population that lives in extreme poverty doubled, halved, or stayed the same? And 65% of people said it had doubled. 5% said it had halved. The 5% are right, 
the 65% are wrong. But he then said, look, if I wrote those three answers on three bananas and I threw those bananas into a cage with a monkey in it, the monkey would pick up the correct answer 33% of the time instead of 5% of the time. It would do six times as well as human beings at answering a question about human society. How can that be? And the answer, I think, it was a 19th century sage who, who put it this way, but it's a, it's a good way of putting it. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know that ain't so. What you, what you think you know that ain't so. Right. But he's, yeah, yeah he's yeah, saying yeah. what you know that ain't so. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. so sure of it. You know, you're absolutely 100%. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're full of things we know to be true, which just are not true. This is tricky territory, my friend, because, yeah, I agree, obviously, but it's tough having conversations with people who are that sure about something. And when a person leads with ideology, like, let's say I'm talking to someone, I'm just purely, I'm like, I want to know just, ex let's explore the truth. And that person's coming to me, like, entirely through the lens of ideology. Well, there's a conflict there. Because, I mean, they don't want to hear from me that they could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a good way to make friends with someone who's leading with ideology. Uh, it, it is a kind of a good way to make friends with a, a rational optimist. I'd like to take a moment to talk about our sponsor, BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? For quite a lot of us right now during this coronavirus pandemic, we are struggling with our most fundamental basic needs such as our needs for security, connection, and opportunities to master our work. I think all of us could use some therapy right now. I know I sure could, which is why I've really been enjoying working with a professional therapist at BetterHelp so I can realize the best version of myself even under the current circumstances. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating with your therapist in just under 48 hours. Note that it's not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. In fact, the service is available for clients worldwide. What I really like about BetterHelp is that you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as you often have to do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is really committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Here's a recent one. Camilla helped me turn my life around. Everything has been so positive for me since our first session. Deep gratitude. I'm pleased to announce a special offer for listeners of the Psychology Podcast. You can get 10% off your first month of professional counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash psychpodcast. That's better H-E-L-P slash psychpodcast. Join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Okay, now back to the show. Well, you're right. The, what, there's one way in which the world does depress me, and that is the number of people who want to, to start with the facts seems to be smaller than I would like it to be. Yeah, me, well, me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> it's frustrating. I mean, you, you work, I work in a dissertation. I work in a, a nerdy little silo of academia where I'm rewarded and I am praised for, wow, that was such a scholarly, nuanced discussion section of your paper you know what i mean and then i enter the real world and i'm like hey everyone i really this is an interesting conversation we're having about politics race religion here's my nuanced discussion section <laughs> about that and it's like goodbye <laughs> nuance nuance is an endangered species at the moment i fear uh the, and 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 there's there's an example of where my optimism may have been a little bit misplaced I don't know about 2010, but certainly in the year 2000, I, well, no, probably in 2010 too, I was pretty darned optimistic about the internet. Uh, I thought this is a fabulous resource. It enables us to check every fact. You know, you can, you can nail the myths. You can, uh, 
you can look things up you can you can find out what other people think you can you can see each other's point of view you're not relying anymore on what some your favorite newspaper is telling you you can jolly well just go out and find the facts for yourself so it's going to bring peace and harmony and utopia and kumbaya and we're all going to love each other but i wasn't quite that naive but i i had an element of of that naivety instead it has polar social media has polarized us far more than i expected and it's a worry yeah it's it's a real world a real worry and it makes sense though from a psychological point of view what what we're seeing on social media the incentive structures are for for likes for social status i mean a li- don't don't they know that didn't the designers know that that like button would directly correlate with dopamine production in the synapses <laughs> if you put your nuanced stuff out there as a tweet it just doesn't get clicked on either way but here's the nuance to that <laughs> the meta nuance of that is that for really for the cognitive explorers among us it actually does release dopamine to a different synapse that just is rare there's a fewer number of people so my my colleague and i uh, most notably colin de young have mapped out I started to map out different dopamine systems and the sex, drugs, rock and roll system is what everyone talks about. But people are not as familiar with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex projection of dopamine where people get, there's a reward value to information, to truthful information, to knowledge, to nuance. And people who score high on IQ, people who score high in certain measures of intellectual curiosity do actually get that kind of sex, drugs, rock and roll hit in a sense. So it's, 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 it's more emerging research. I could send you a paper. I can send you the paper on that. If I, you want. I'd be very interested in that. So you found the spot in my brain where yeah. I, I get a real thrill out of reading a good article or finding a new fact or, or even exploding a, a myth. You've, you found the nuance, Sulcus. Yes. Yeah, that's your next book. <laughs> that's your, that, that actually would be a, a neat book. Yeah, there are different neurons that code for different value of things and um of course sex you know sex the primal rewards have very subcortical projections but there are higher level cognitive projections that exist for that respond to the reward value of information you can see throughout the course of human evolution we would it'd be very valuable to have backward information that was adaptive <laughs> to survive but not as many people get automatically excited by that far far less yeah, but do you think do you think we're all capable of it if we just get educated into the experience of enjoying a good non factual non fictional story or something like that, or or do you think some people just have that and others don't? Mira. Well, <laughs> it's a great question. It's a great question, and I I would love to say everyone is is capable of it, and I think that's true to a certain extent. Just like with creativity, which we're going to get to, because that's an area of mutual interest of ours. I've written a book on creativity and done research on that. In the same sense, people always ask me that question when they read my book, because like, the book's called Wired to Create, and so interviewers will say, oh, what does that mean? Are some people more wired? Are we all wired to create? And I like to be just honest. <laughs> you know. And that's the individual differences exist. There's a bell curve of, of every single trait, psychological trait, psychological trait. There's a lot of variation that's influenced by both genetics and the environment interacting. So do I think every single person's equally probability of becoming a creative genius? No, <laughs> that one can't say that is the case. I, I completely agree with that, but I, I do sometimes find the emphasis on creativity in stories about innovation lends people to thinking that there's something godlike about innovators and inventors, and that's one of the things I'm trying to redress in my new book. I'm trying to say... Actually, do you know what? There's not. Let's take the Wright brothers. You know, Orville and Wilbur Wright. Did they have some unbelievable spark of genius that that most people don't have? I don't think so. They were described by the guy who took the photograph of the plane taking off on the first day as the workingest boys I ever saw. That is to say, they just worked at it. They worked incredibly hard. They did a lot of experiments. They were open-minded enough to learn from other people. They put in the hours. These are the characteristics that pretty well anybody could have, albeit, you know, so when you say creativity, 
do you mean workingist? <laughs> it's a good. It's a good. It's really good. I and and I'm I'm glad I'm fine to I'm fine to jump into this topic of innovation now. Here here's my ner- I'm gonna put my nerdy hat on for a second and my critical self critical and and point out that there's such a thing in psychology called restricted samples. This is this is the big problem with Eric Anders Ericsson's. God bless him. He 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 passed away recently and a real legend in the field. And his work on expertise has been very valuable. But me and him, cordially, throughout his lifetime, we would spar about this a bit from time to time in a friendly way. Because he would say, okay, well, I'm looking at experts, and I'm trying to understand what their special juice is. And I found they have the ability to focus for long periods of time. They have, and therefore, those are the characteristics that matter, not IQ and all these other things. But that, he's looking at restricted samples, so how do you, what would happen if you looked at how innovation works among a naturally occurring sample of the population that wasn't already selected out on factors such as IQ, education, you know, other personal characteristics? How can you conclude those things don't matter just because you're looking at a highly selected sample where those things have already been selected out? So therefore those things aren't doing the, the prediction anymore. One point in my book, I... I write about I write the, the, a brief biographical sketch of Gordon Moore, the man behind Moore's Law, and I say, you know, by now you've probably got an image of the standard West Coast Silicon Valley entrepreneur innovator in your mind. He's an unreasonable guy. He knows his own mind. He's an immigrant. He's he's restless. He's hard to satisfy. He's incredibly sort of dedicated he's very impatient you know i'm describing sort of steve jobs or something like that and then i say well hang on here's this guy gordon moore he lives about 10 miles from where he was born he's he he left california briefly uh, for a couple of years that was it otherwise he's been in the bay area all his life he's preternaturally reasonable and nice everyone says he's the nicest guy you ever met he doesn't like confronting people He's unbelievably patient. His favorite pastime is fishing. Well, you need to be patient for that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I run through it and I say, look, this guy is the exact opposite personality-wise of Steve Jobs or someone like that. And yet he's in his own way just as successful an entrepreneur. And he's been right at the heart of the Silicon Valley story for, for a long time. So what is your point there that you you found like a contradiction to the... The stereotype, because for instance, like you, you dispel the lone genius stereotype, but then I could come back and point out, well, there are, here's some examples. It looks like they're actually lone genius does exist, but you're just pointing out other examples of non lone genius examples that also do exist. So all these things can exist simultaneously. So, so is the, is the meta point there that there are multiple pathways to innovation or are you arguing there's one specific pathway that seems more predominant? I mean, I would say that. I don't think the lone genius does achieve as much and that you might find me examples of lone geniuses who had philosophical insights that were extraordinary, but I don't think you'd find they were practical innovators who changed the world. For that, you can't be a lone genius. You have to be a collaborator to some extent. Um, So I don't think there are exceptions there. But the idea that an entrepreneur, an innovator, has to be a restless, impatient, aggressive, unreasonable person, I think that doesn't actually hold. Uh, In other words, I think the personality characteristics don't seem to me to matter that much, whereas the ability to work with other people does matter. But I I haven't done the, the, the regression analysis on my case histories, but and and you know you'll see what what I do in the in the book is I take a bunch of case histories pretty well at random. I mean they're about interesting and important issues, but I leave some out. I don't don't write about textiles in the book, for example, very important technology. But I I take these stories and I tell story after story of of how innovations came about. Then I use that as my database, saying look what what are the common themes that are emerging from these stories. Now that's not terribly scientific, I admit, and you're going to tell me I didn't. You know, I'm about to say that. Yes, <laughs> I, I'm pointing out. But I'm a writer. 
but I'm, wait, my mind is being blown because I just want to point out something. You, your whole argument is about, you know, the tr- looking at the trends of, of the progress over human history from a, an objective statistical point of view, not listening to people's stories narratives and ideologies and you, surely you see that contradiction in yourself there well yeah but no the stories i'm telling are not uh, you know they're not sort of moralizing themes they're biographical factual what happened next stories but you're right i mean i'm aware of the contradiction i discuss it in the book that i say the individual inventor and innovator doesn't matter as much as we think that an awful lot of innovations would have happened if the same, if the Edison or, or or Jeff Bezos had been run over by a bus. You know, we'd still have online retail or light bulbs. So the individual doesn't matter to to that extent, and he's always embedded in a social network, and he's building on the work of predecessors and successors. So why am I telling his story as a, as a particular story? You know, why am I singling out his life? history his bi- biography well partly because i want to make that point along the way that this guy gets the credit you know samuel morse gets the credit for the telegraph and marconi gets the credit for, for radio but let's look at the way they were embedded in in society and the way they had to, to, to talk to other people and the other reason for telling it is people love reading stories <laughs> they do they do love it that's true <laughs> and, and and they are fascinating stories well let's just talk about the study this is my doctoral work. So there's a table I want to point to because this is what I'm, I'm talking about with, natu- with looking at naturally occurring samples versus your restricted samples is that I can tell you what we found from a naturally occurring point of view. So you're right. From the jerk perspective, we found zero relationship with the agreeableness dimension. And I, and I laugh a lot, of, a lot of times as well as neuroticism. So I laugh when I give talks sometimes. I say, trust me, I wish neuroticism was predictive of creative achievement i would be a creative genius <laughs> um and and also you know we like to ha- we have this myth we like to think that nice guys or nice people finish you know last look i wish that, but there's no correlation at all with agreeableness because that puts everything in the pot at once including including iq g and as well that's what you know g general intelligence as well as divergent thinking and it turns out when you put all this in the pot yeah, and IQ is is not pre- terribly predictive, nearly as predictive as openness to experience. So it seems like this personality trait, and I wonder how you map on the openness to experience personality trait and in intellectual, which encompasses intellectual curiosity, but it also, but that was more important for the sciences, for the arts. It was more important to be open to your emotions, to your intuition, to rely on your intuition, your experience, your experiential self, you know in the world and your appreciation of art and beauty and and being a deep thinker you know being a very imaginative and, and having a fantasy world a rich fantasy world so i'm wondering how this naturally occurring data maps onto your your rich collection of stories so i'm just looking at it and am i right in reading it that openness is significantly correlated with creativity in the arts but not in the sciences is that what your chart is saying correct and yes and in intellect in the sciences Something interesting there is intellectual curiosity is more predictive of creative achievement in the sciences than IQ. So we maybe undervalue intellectual curiosity and overvalue IQ in this. But within the I can well believe. But within that. the art, I can oh, well good, believe good. That. But within artistic creativity, yeah, IQ wasn't predictive, and neither was intellectual curiosity. Terribly predictive. It really was was these aspects of openness to one's experience and you know emotions, fantasy. It's just having this rich, you know, daydreaming world within your own head. So fantasy versus ideas is another interesting distinction within this domain. Perhaps I need to just clarify that I think that this is perhaps more at the scientific discovery, artistic originality end of the spectrum than at the innovator entrepreneur end of the spectrum, which is mostly what I'm writing about. I mean, they are connected, of course, but one of the things I'm trying to do is say there are people like Thomas Edison and Jeff Bezos, as I've mentioned before, who are extremely good innovators, but they wouldn't really be described as brilliant inventors. You know, they haven't come up with anything particularly new uh, themselves. They've just turned relatively new ideas into practical, affordable, and, and reliable things. And 
in that sense, I'm sort of trying to get away from the idea that in, invent that innovators are scientists or and innovators and scientists are the same thing. I think quite often that they're, they're quite different. But putting that on one side and looking back at your chart, because I think it's really, really interesting. What does the high correlation, or is it low correlation with agreeableness, tell you about scientists? Yes, in the sciences, it seems like it to be more disagreeable is, uh, is, is good. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm just yeah. starting. That's a, a negative, a negative regression. Yeah. I'm just starting a, a biography read, to read a biography which I'm reviewing of J. B. S. Haldane, the, the great scientist, and came across a remark very early on, just describing his personality. A very distinguished guy called Hans Kalmus sent Haldane a manuscript of his new book on human genetics. Kalmus was a longtime colleague and a protege of sorts a Czech refugee who had, with Haldane's help, found work at University College just before the Second World War. None of these personal ties softened Haldane's assessment of the manuscript. It ought not to be published. He listed some errors, then added, I could go on indefinitely. The proposed book would not only calm, harm Kalmus, but science of genetics itself. You would be better advised, if this is possible, to go back to experimental biology rather than to continue to work in human genetics. I mean, that's brutal to one of your protégés. <laughs> that's quite, quite brutal. <laughs> About a book yeah. that you've written. I guess the point here is there's different levels of analysis. One can, can try to tackle this question, I guess. And these stories are telling us information. But it's just funny. You'd be the first one to tell me in a different context that stories don't necessarily mean generalizable truths about innovation. No, you're absolutely right. And... and Plural of anecdote is not data, as, as somebody once said. You know, the one thing I did do is not sit down and say, here's my theory about how innovation works, and I'm now going to produce evidence to support it in a confirmation bias sort of way. I mean, there's nothing particularly wrong with that, but that's how most books are written. You know, I'm the prosecutor. I'm trying to prosecute a case. I'm going to mention everything that supports my argument that the guy is guilty but i'm not gonna i'm gonna gloss over the things that imply that my guy is is innocent instead of that i said i'm gonna tell a bunch of stories for six chapters about innovations and how they work and then after that i'm gonna start to say what i think the general themes are so it's you're right it's not hard science what i'm doing and i'm not pretending it is it is a literary effort after all but it is at least data first, theory second, rather than the other way around. Okay, so I hear you. It seems like creative people don't have a linear pathway. They, like Picasso said, I often don't know where I'm going until I get there. There's a very non-linear sort of uh, thing where later, like creative emerges. It's not like that this, maps quite well yeah. into what onto what I call serendipity, which is you know the need to change direction, the need to look out for unexpected results that weren't what you thought. Kevlar, Teflon, the post-it note, all discovered by people looking for something completely different who thought they'd failed, and then they realized they had something even more valuable. Absolutely, maps on. So I do see a lot of mappings, and you talk about a bottom-up approach to innovation as opposed to a top-down, and I think that bottom-up dovetails with that emergence. Your, your model of innovation, I think, in its broad brushes are, are quite right, and and maybe it's just worth distinguishing here between the process and the person, because our prior discussion for the last 20 minutes was a lot about what are the personality characteristics that are predictive. But that's a separate issue than what you've outlined, which seems to conform quite nicely, I thought, to a lot of our own discoveries in our book on the process of the whole creative system. And you can see so you can start to separate the person from the process. Kevin Kelly has a book called What Technology Wants, which sees the whole thing from a completely different perspective and says, look, technology is in charge of its own destiny. It's, it's inching towards certain, in certain directions, in certain times, in certain places, and it's kind of choosing the people who do the discovering. Now, he's, being a, you know, he's going a little bit too far in, in that deliberately, but it's a very interesting perspective, and he calls it the technium. You know, this, this machine, this evolving organism of our technology, which, you know, when it wants to invent search engines, it picks Larry Page and Sergey Bring to do it. But 
it's going to do the, do it. Whoever's around, you know, somebody's going to be there to, to invent search engines for it. And it's quite an interesting way of looking at the world because, you know, one of the pieces of evidence for it, which he first introduced me to, and I then followed up the research on, it's very, very striking, is the phenomenon of simultaneous invention. Oh, yeah. Dean Simonton's done some good work on that. Yeah. 21 different people invented the light bulb independently, basically. You know, it's extraordinary. And only one got credit. <laughs> and only one gets credit, exactly. And so often these priority disputes that bog down innovators, I mean, you know, the Wright brothers, Marconi, Samuel Morse, these guys spent some of the best lives of, years of their life in court defending their monopolies, their patents, their intellectual property against furious rivals who said, well, I came, I came up with half, the, half of that idea. And it, it said, you know, they should say, yeah, actually, it's probably true, you probably did. And I, that's one of the reasons I make that intellectual property is, is misguided and is doing more harm than good at the moment. That's a great point. This idea, the Dean, Time, Dean Simon talks about how if an idea, it's often, if an idea is ready to pop out, so to speak, you're, you, I'm mixing, meta, you have your ideas have sex metaphors, so I'm like, you know, when <laughs> I'm trying to birth. like, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying, that's where I'm going with this, pop out. Uh, when idea is ready to be born, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> when idea is ready to be born, it, it's almost in the air for the picking. This, is, this was Dean Simonton's point. So he said multiples make sense, you know, that people, that, that it's not like these labs are stealing from each other. Can't we admit that, like, we're all taking from the universe? Going back to the search engine, I found that a very useful example because it's very clear to us. The reason search engines were invented in the 1990s by lots of different people around the same time is, is not because there was suddenly some deity who decided to implant the idea of search engines in certain human brains. But because once you've invented the internet, it's kind of inevitable that you're going to invent the search engine. But the weird thing is, nobody sees it coming. So back in the 80s, nobody is going around saying, you know, once we've invented the internet, somebody's going to make a ton of money out of search engines. Even Larry Page and Sergey Brin don't think they're inventing search engines to start with. They think they're cataloging the internet. There's a strange asymmetry here, which I've wrestled with and don't fully understand, which is the predictability in retrospect of technological evolution, but the unpredictability in prospect. It's such a good point, and it's, it's so true. And I, I, I wonder, what about the exceptions? Like those who had that crazy vision that no one else saw and no one else believed in. Do you think Zuckerberg, when he was, maybe he didn't know it would be this, this big, but he started to have visions of like what a social media system would look like and and how it would work for people, why people would like it. But that hadn't existed before. Yeah, I mean, there are forgotten predecessors who thought of invention. There's a, I would argue that if, if Zuckerberg hadn't met the Winklevoss twins and if Zuckerberg had become a professor of neuroscience or something instead, I'd be pretty surprised if, we, if somebody else hadn't scooped the pool and become the extremely rich founder of some company with a different name, admittedly, but <laughs> very similar to Facebook. There's a, there's a certain inevitability about that. But, I mean, I do write about a guy in, who, who really did invent the telephone in, you know, a long time before Alexander Graham Bell, you know, 20, 20 years before or something, and then died in penury and poverty and nobody appreciated what he'd done. But it's, you could make the case that He'd shown the principle, but it's never really going to work till you've got till other technologies have made further advances. Again, I make this case with wheeled suitcases in the book, you know, which seems to be a classic example of a technology that comes too late. I mean, why didn't we invent wheeled suitcases fifty years ago, hundred years ago? Well, it turns out if you research the history of this, you find that there are people patenting and suggesting wheeled suitcases way back into the nineteen twenties, but they don't catch on. Why not? Basically because, you know, wheels are big and clunky and, and heavy and air, airports or train stations are small and easy to navigate and porters are available and cheap. So actually, it's a waste of time sticking wheels on suitcases until roughly the 1970s. So there's surprisingly few things that you can name that we should have invented 500 years before we did. It's a great point. I mean, yeah, I love that you make that point. 
Why does innovation require freedom? There's a general correlation here that, you know, relatively free societies from the city-states in Italy to the Song dynasty in China to modern California have been places where people have been free to experiment, free to, to innovate. So what is it about freedom that, that, that is necessary? Well, we shouldn't forget that it's the freedom of the consumer to express his wishes that is quite important. Uh, you know, the, the Soviet consumer was not really free to express his desire for washing machines rather than nuclear missiles. Probably more important, it's the freedom of the innovator and the entrepreneur to experiment, to make mistakes, change direction, to change your mind, to backtrack, to seek out new sources of investment in a system where you have to do what you've promised to do or you have to get permission to do something else, then it doesn't work. So, for example, today, in innovating in the nuclear power industry is basically very difficult because you have to go back to the regulator and say, look, I've changed my mind. I want to build this nuclear power station to a slightly different design and I use a different material. You've got to start the whole licensing process all over again and that costs you $100 million or something and so people don't do that. Whereas if you're inventing a new video game, you are free to just say, no, do you know what? I'm going to do it a different way. I'm going to start a completely different way of doing the same thing today. So that freedom to change course is, I think, probably the most important factor in the freedom behind innovation. There are some obstacles to that. One you talk about is, you talk about governments can be a big obstacle to innovation. Another one is people like, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Ulkianoff have talked about and how universities these days seem to be more and more antithetical to the spirit of what you're talking about when you talk about innovation, which is trial and error, right? The safe space to fail. Exactly. And, and the grant-giving bodies in science have, I'm sorry to say, become obsessed with getting you to write down in your grant application what it is you're going to discover. Well, what's the point of doing the experiment if you already know what what it is you're going to discover. This episode is brought to you by Magic Spoon. For the past few years, I've been trying to cut down on carbs and sugar, which unfortunately has meant that I had to cut out cereal. Cereal was always my guilty pleasure, so I was really bummed out about that. Which is why I was excited to discover Magic Spoon. Not only is their cereal zero sugar, 11 grams of protein, and only three net grams of carbs per serving, but it's also really tasty. Coming in four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry. Honestly, it tastes so good that it feels like it's too good to be true. On top of all that, it's keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, low carb, and GMO free. The gluten-free part is really important for me personally due to my sensitivity to gluten. My favorite flavor is blueberry. Growing up, blueberry cereal was my absolute fave, so this one is really nostalgic for me. Go to magicspoon.com psychology to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code psychology at checkout to get free shipping. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So go to magicspoon.com psychology and use the code psychology for free shipping. I'd like to thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring this podcast. Can you talk a little bit more about your point about governments? Is that what you're talking about with grant funding agencies and things like that? Yeah, and that was, that was one of the examples. Governments can help innovation and they can hinder it. A good example of them helping it is the Clinton administration passing a raft of legislation through Congress that was designed deliberately to make e-commerce possible. It was essentially very permissive legislation, very libertarian legislation, somewhat utopian, if you like. And it was a rare moment of bipartisan agreement that this is what we needed to do to, to clear the undergrowth, to make it possible for, to roll the runway for uh, Amazon and others to take off from. Examples of governments 
preventing innovation, I would cite uh, the European Union on genetic modification of crops, where it's never been banned. They've never actually said no. It is legal to produce a genetically modified crop in Europe and grow it. But in order to do so, you must go through a process that is so lengthy, so labyrinthine, so uncertain in its outcome, that nobody any longer bothers to even try. And I give the story of BASF with its one of its potato products, how positively Kafka-esque the way in which it would think it would get to the end of the process, and then someone would go to court and say, ah, but you, in approving this, you used the reason that you originally gave, not the reason you've given more recently, you know, whatever. You know, it's a sort of just bonkers process. And that has cut Europe off from technologies that have manifestly reduced the use of pesticides in other parts of the world and in other crops, which seems to me a pity. So there is, you know, government can be a real problem to innovation innovators as a regulator and also as a subsidizer and protector of incumbent interests. You know, powerful companies lobby government saying, can you just bring in these rules because actually we don't want this new upstart rival eating our lunch. Again, very good European example, a guy called James Dyson, who's a British innovator, makes these hand dryers and vacuum cleaners and things, and he invented the bagless vacuum cleaner. And the big German vacuum cleaner manufacturers saw this as a threat, so they went to the European Union and said, you know what, we should have new rules in Europe about how you measure the power output of vacuum cleaners, because there's a little problem here, which is that our vacuum cleaners ramp up the power they demand as they get half full of dust, because the bags are no longer so good. You know, they're, they're having to suck harder too, because the bag is getting in the way. So let's change the rules away from the international standard and let's say every vacuum cleaner now should be tested for its power consumption without dust, because then we can appear a little bit cheaper than Mr. Dyson. He eventually went to court. It took him five years. He won. But this ridiculous, you know, little European regulation was thrown out and we were back to the global regulation. But by then, Dyson had imitators from China who were beginning to compete with him. So it's a, it's a fascinating story of, of how... Crony capitalists use government to raise barriers to entry against innovators. I hear you, Matt, and there's so much you gain from from these rich stories that you just can't capture with regression uh, efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> so it's I, I enjoyed getting lost in your world <laughs> and learning about about the barriers as well as the facilitators of innovation. Just a thought here, and I'm, I'm, I want to know what you think about this. I'm a biologist, and I often felt that my biologist colleagues were suffering from a form of physics envy, whereby they wished they were more mathematical. They wished they had more laws. If it makes you feel any better, psychologists have biology envy. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes all turtles all the way down. It turns all the way down, you're right. I mean, what I was going to say was that somebody said biology is the science of exceptions, not rules, which is a bit unfair. But, it, it, you know, look at, look at Darwin. He's essentially, he's using no regression. He's just saying, here's a bunch of stories that support my point of view. And I'm finding in the variety of life ways of testing my hypothesis without being too mathematically precise about it. Now, I recognize we, we have to have maths in biology too. I'm not saying we throw it all out. But, no, I know. But perhaps my training has led me to, be, to use case histories a bit more. That's so fascinating because there's a great point there as well about physics really does live in the, the rules. It's not like I had Sean Carroll on this podcast and we, we kept bumping up against like, when we start talking about the biological realm of life, there's a certain unpredictability there. And then we start talking about humans. Some the, what I study, the human nature, the, my gosh, it's, it's hard to come up with general rules. That are, you'll come up with general rules and then you'll meet one 
neurodiverse human being who breaks all the rules <laughs> in the way that they see the world. And it's like, it's like, what do I do with you? I don't want to ignore you. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're important. So I hear you, Matt. I just want to thank you so much for the chat today and for, you're one of my favorite science writers. I don't say that to all my guests. You're one of my favorite science writers. And yeah, thanks for inspiring me. Well, Scott, I, I've had many interesting conversations about this book, but this has definitely been one of the most interesting, and I've, I've learned a lot in it. So thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of the podcast on iTunes and subscribe to the Psychology Podcast YouTube channel as we're really trying to increase our viewership on YouTube. In fact, many of these episodes are in video format on YouTube, so you'll definitely want to check out that channel. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.